And welcome everybody to another Smart Money Circle update. I'm Adam Sarhan. As always, want to thank you very much for being here. Today, I have a special guest, Nick Ribino, who's the CFA, one of the portfolio managers at ticker symbol EQTIX. He's also a PM at Shelton Capital Management with over $4 billion in assets under management. And Nick has a specialty in options, and that'll be the primary focus for today. So Nick, thank you so much for taking the time and speaking with us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So Nick, I always like to begin. Can you tell us your story and how you got to where you are today, please? Absolutely. So coming out of college, I started at Charles Schwab, you know, part of their Reg Rep trainee program to learn to become a broker. I was at Schwab for about five and a half years. I worked my way up onto the options and futures trading desk, became a manager on that desk. Um, and I actually also created Schwab's nationwide options training curriculum, the Options Academy, that they oh, wow. put brokers through that want to join the options and futures trading desk. So I'm sure they've made a lot of adjustments to it since I left, but spent a lot of time teaching, a lot of time trading complex options and derivative strategies. And then about five, five and a half years ago, came over to Shelton Capital to be a portfolio manager on their options override strategies. Oh, I love that. Now, you came out of school did you study options or have any trading experience before Schwab or just Schwab threw you into, how'd you get involved with options specifically? Absolutely. So didn't have any experience with options or derivatives before I got to Schwab. And yeah. as part of their Red Rep trainee program, you study for the series seven and options just, they just made sense to me. I mean, it just clicked. A lot of other folks struggled with it, but you know, it just was something that I kind of naturally gravitated towards. And so Knew I wanted to join the options team. I kind of studied up, you know, joined the options overflow line. So when they're busy, I would get those trade calls and yep. then join the options team after being at Schwab for about a year and a half. So I was the youngest person on the options desk at Schwab at that time and just got to sit around and, and learn from some of the best. I love it. So let's talk about your investment strategy, please. Can you dive in and let us know what you do? Absolutely. So at Shelton, we've got essentially three different options overwrite strategies. One, you've already mentioned, that's EQTIX. That's our mutual fund. That's a derivative income fund. It's in the derivative income category with Morningstar. Um, it's a five-star fund. We actually recently uh, just saw a list where we're one of the top 10 largest derivative income funds out there at All this right. point. So, yep, yeah, that's All great. Uh, we also have an equity income SMA, similar, a couple small differences to the way the fund is run. And we also do you know, a concentrated stock override. So if someone's got, you know, $10 million in Apple, for example, and they want to generate cash flow or protect downside on that position, we'll employ option strategies around those concentrated positions to, you know, better manage the, the risk and adjusted return for those clients. Our approach in the EQTIX fund and in our equity income SMA, we're looking for value-oriented stocks. You know, with the covered call strategy, we're selling away the unlimited upside. So we're not looking for those high flyers. We're never going to ride a stock up 100% you know, with, without missing out on some of that upside. So looking for a good, good fundamentals, good value-oriented companies. We'll compare their, their fundamentals to other stocks in their same sector. You know, we're not going to have the same PE ratios in the IT space as we do in materials, for example. And then in the fund, we're going to be writing calls against typically just a portion of the position. You know, we want to retain some of that upside potential. We usually cover maybe 30 to 40 percent of a position with calls. So that way we were generating, you know, meaningful cash flow, but still have that upside potential if the stock does, you know, decide to make a run. And the focus being, you know, value oriented cash flow generating equity portfolio. I love that. So what you're looking for, if I can help break it down to layman terms, is you're looking for undervalued stocks or stocks that are attractively valued for your your investments and then once you find your those stocks you're going to sink your teeth into them when somebody owns let's say a thousand shares of xyz and it's attractively valued and you have more room for appreciation you don't want to lose all of the stock but you're going to generate some income by selling calls a covered call strategy against the third or thereabouts 20 30 percent of the position so instead of a thousand shares you might get called away 200 or 300 shares and still own 700. Is that a correct, correct. way of summarizing yep. it? That is correct. Absolutely. And, and a big piece of that as well is, you know, if a stock makes an explosive run, take NVIDIA, just easy example from this year. Yeah. Well, if we've only got 30 or 40% of the position covered, we've got unlimited upside, no, no cap on the remaining chunk of that position. So, you know, we want to generate cash flow again. That's kind of our primary focus, but capital appreciation is also a big, a big component of the overall return as well. I love that. So let's talk about, walk me through that. So let's say you get called away a third of the stock. 
you're selling calls on Apple or NVIDIA or whatever the case may be on XYZ, and you're collecting income because I'm assuming you're doing weekly calls. Is that correct? Or you do monthly? So we, we typically stick with monthly calls. You know, we're going to oh, stay okay. fairly short duration. It also mm -hmm. depends on the you know underlying position and the, the time of, I guess, the yearly cycle. For example, during earnings cycles, you can write shorter duration options and get more attractive cash flows than you can in a normal non non volatile or stock specific volatile period. So we might write shorter duration options there, but typically we're going to be writing, you know, about 60 days out or so to expiration. There's okay. kind of a sweet spot. You want to be at probably 90 days and under to be in a more okay. attractive time decay window for options. But if we were writing, you know, front week options, we're not going to be able to go, you know, very far out of the money and get any kind of meaningful cash flow. And so, you know, if we look at easy example, it's just Apple. It's just, you know, one of the, the biggest names out there right now, the stock's at 189 and change. You know, writing next week's 192 and a half call brings in 82 cents. That's not bad. I mean, that's not bad cash flow for, you know, a, a 10 day right there, but that's pretty close to where the stock's currently trading. You know, we don't have a lot of upside potential there before we run into that call. Got and it. the number one thing that detracts from cash flow you keep in pocket is cash flow you have to pay to buy calls back if you don't want to let a stock go. Because we don't let everything get assigned just because it's in the money. So by going out a little farther in time, you know, you look at the January expiration, for example, you're able to get worthwhile cash flow going up to, you know, 195, even close to 200. That gives us more room for the stock to appreciate, reduces the likelihood of needing to pay premium to buy those calls back. And it's just kind of a, a good balance between the objectives that we're, we're looking to achieve. I love it. So let's fast forward. So you do anything within 90 days. And then one of two, th I love options because it's binary. You either win or lose type of a thing, right? So either yep. you, <laughs> it's in the money or it's out of the money. So if, if it works, you collect the income. In other words, the stock is below the strike price by expiration. The uh, options expire worthless and you collect the income there. Now, if mm -hmm. it's above the strike price, then a third of the position is called away. Now you've got the 700 out of the thousand shares left. What do you do going forward? Do you sell another third or options or do you just let it go and, and ride the rest? Absolutely. So I guess there's there's two different potentials here. One is you let the shares get called away. We don't mm -hmm. always let the stock get called away. Easy example, you know, if we had 190 calls on Apple and the stock's at 191, we could let them take the shares, but that's not a difficult rollout. We pay a dollar to buy that back. We most likely received more than a dollar to sell it. And we sell a new call to, you know, generate the dollar we're paying on that, on that buyback and then also some right. additional cash flow. If something gets truly what we would kind of call buried, you know, we're 10, 20 percent in the money, that's where we certainly might let something go. And then we'll look to replace those shares that were called away. You know, if we get, you know, 500 grand in proceeds there, we'll look to typically find another name in that same sector, you know, that has attractive fundamentals. You know, if we wanted to maintain the position, we could just roll those calls out. But if Got we were it. buyers at 150 and now stocks at 190, there might be something out there that's now more attractive to put that capital into. And then we would go back to writing, you know, probably about a third of the, the remaining position, whatever was not called away. And a big piece of, especially in EQTIX, is, is managing towards our distribution yield. So you can only distribute, you know, short-term capital gains. You can take some dividends in there, but we want to be mindful of, you know, if we sell a call for a dollar and buy it back for two, that's a short-term capital loss. Still might be a winning trade overall. The stock might be up five or 10 points, but right. that's a short-term capital loss that can't be distributed. Right now, the fund's got a little over a nine and a quarter, 9.25% uh, distribution yield on the trailing 12 months. So you know, we want to be mindful of that, preserve that. And in some cases, if we wanted to do what we call ratioing up, if we have you know a third of the position written, those calls go in the money. Well, if I can buy back three calls and sell six, for example, to replace it, I might be able to, even if I'm paying a lot of premium here to buy these back, I'm generating more premium, higher strike level. We're able to move those calls up more significantly, get out of the stock's way. So that gives us that flexibility to you know, have more upside potential or take advantage of that ability to ratio up and continue to generate better premiums. And that's even by rolling them out. So if, if you get close to expiration and you're not happy or you're out of the money and the money, whatever, you're just not happy with the way things are, you can always just roll them out and move the strike price accordingly, pay a little bit more, but you'd sell the other ones and that'll offset the cost there yep, in correct. an ideal yep. scenario. Beautiful. Yep. Well, that's a, thank you very much for the overview. Do you ever go mm -hmm. long any options or is it always selling? and that's the first question. Yep. So exclusively on the sell side of options in the fund, you know, we're just selling time value. We're just selling cover calls. You know, buying options is more of a speculative approach unless you're buying, you know, protective put on shares that you hold. And being that this is an income focused fund, we're just going to stay on the sell side of premium. Got it. And just calls, no puts, correct? Correct. Understood. Beautiful. And they're always covered. In other words, you own the stock and then you'd sell covered calls on top. Gotcha. Absolutely. Well, beautiful. Yep. Nick, that's very, very... Um, 
I, that's a very good explanation. So let's talk about risk. I know a lot of people have a hard time with risk and in investing, specifically with options. It's even more complex. So how do you handle risk and what are some mistakes you've seen people make with respect to risk management, please? Absolutely. So I guess the way that we approach risk is, you know, again, we're looking for singles, doubles, we'll take walks, we're looking at value oriented stocks, we're writing calls that are always covered. So people think about options. And a lot of times they'll think, you know, risk, they're speculative, there's, you know, potential to, to really lose your shirt here. And there are absolutely strategies out there that you can play with options where you can lose, you know, more money than you've, you've put into your portfolio in the first place. But we're not employing those strategies. You know, their options are in a lot of ways, a, a tool for risk transfer. You buy a put, you've spent some money, but you've offset and offloaded the risk of the shares that you're holding to somebody else, you know, just in the right. same way that I offload risk to Geico by paying them every month. So in case I wreck my car, you know, I'm not holding the bag here. So right. we approach it from a perspective of we're looking for value oriented companies, looking for good fundamentals. We're not looking for these high flyers. We're not chasing volatility and premium. Because of course, you know, the more volatile stocks out there, they do generate better premiums, but there's a reason that they're paying those better premiums. And it's not because this is a real safe, calm, you know, blue chip kind of name. It's because that stock exhibits that kind of volatility. I think that the mistakes that I've seen people make that really get them into hot water are trading strategies that they don't really understand would be one. You know, if you're trading naked options, for example, you've got to really know what your risk is. You have to have discipline to a trade strategy, know when you're going to close a position, whether it's going for or against you. And then I think that people, you know, sometimes you get the, the kind of curse of that first win. If you go out and you place one trade that does really well, <laughs> options right. are highly leveraged. I mean, if you make a good options trade, you're not necessarily making 5% or 10%. You can be making 500%, 1,000%. And, you know, especially back in my days at, at the options desk at Schwab, I've seen people turn, you know, a $6,000 IRA into $1.3 million in four months. Wow. It basically flipped heads 20 times in a row. At a certain point, that's all going to come crashing to an end. But they threw their entire account at the same speculative, out of the money, long trade again and again, and just hit again and again. But at a certain point, you don't flip heads, you flip tails one time, and it kind of all comes crashing down. So I think, being mindful of the capital that you're allocating to options trades, understanding the strategy that you're employing, and then having an exit strategy, whether it goes for or against you. You know, if an option position is going against you, at some point you need to shut it down. Blow what out. point is that? And it's and it's good to have those those price points and those those levels in mind before you place the trade, because once you're making money or losing money, you know, hand over fist very quickly, emotion starts to get involved. And emotion really doesn't have that much place in an in investment strategy. You know, you need to have a logical approach of if I you know, for example, when I used to trade a lot more, you know, before my trading was as heavily scrutinized as it is as a portfolio manager, if my money doubled, if I doubled on a position, I immediately closed half. I'm not debating it. I'm not looking at charts, trying to decide if I think it's going to continue. I've doubled my money, half of it's done. And now it's all house's money. You know, I could have held on. Maybe I would have made more, but don't let a winning trade turn into a losing trade because you lack discipline and didn't adhere to your own trade strategy. So I think understanding what you're doing, monitoring those positions, and then, you know, really in the management, kind of starting slow. I think that, you know, option strategies, you know, covered call strategies, they can have a bigger play in a portfolio, but when you want to speculate and do your iron condors, or your ratio spreads, or go long options, that should be a very small satellite piece of the, of the portfolio. You know, again, you buy a long option, you can make a ton of money, or you could lose everything you put into it. So don't put more into it than you're able to, you know, absorb and still sleep at night. Yeah, I love it. You're speaking my language. So I wrote a book and it was number one on Amazon every day for two months. It's called Psychological Analysis. And the whole point is to teach people how to make rational, not emotional decisions with your money. So I, I smell yeah. what you're cooking 100%. Curio yeah. I just had a curiosity, uh, Nick, you had mentioned the person who had a $6,000 account go to 1. million, whatever it was, without any details. What did they do? I'm assuming they bought options. Can you speak a little bit to what the actual strategy Absolutely. was? Absolutely. So it was on uh, an index ETF. It was on, you know, Q's or diamonds or spiders. It was one of those. It's been a while now, but they basically yeah. just went well out of the money, fairly short duration, you know, nothing more than a month or two months out at the most and threw everything at out of the money options, which again, one time it goes the wrong way. One time it doesn't go up, you know, that could easily go against you there, but they just went out to very far out of the money, speculative options threw everything at it. And the market just went their way time and time again, and they just racked up those wins. 
So in other words, the market was in a strong bull phase and they would go long, buy calls above the market, the market would rally, they'd hit, and then buy calls again, going out X amount of time, and then it hit. And then eventually the bull market stopped going up, it went sideways or went down, and then they potentially can lose everything because what they're doing essentially is they're risking a dollar to make a dime, if I understand what you're saying properly. So if they get wiped out, game over. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So they were certainly making more leverage returns, I would say, than you know, a dollar per dime, but they're going and buying options that we're well out of the money and the market will price in, you know, the options market will kind of price in its expectations of whether an option will be in the money or not. People have sometimes reference Delta as, you know, the percent likelihood that an option is going to be in the money at expiration. Right. Technically, it's not exactly that. It's about, you know, the expected price change for a dollar move in the underlying. But with the whole put your money where your mouth is, you know, Understood. mentality, if they're only putting 20 cents on it, that's the, the risk they view of that option going on the money. So they're buying things way out of the money and the market just kind of continued to go you know, up more and then kind of exceed expectations. And so, you know, they'd be buying options for 30 cents, selling them for two bucks, but then they would do that oh, again wow. and just throw their entire, entire account at that trade. Wow. And again, you know, you throw your entire account at it and you flip heads 10 times in a row, things go great. Thankfully, in that instance, you know, the options team that they called in to talk to, we got them to take half a million dollars off the table in cash. So hey, look what you did with six grand. Let's just right. put 500 G's over here to just right. let that be. Seriously. And that's what they had left when they flipped tails the first time. And so that thankfully, and so it still worked out for them. But I mean, I've seen the other side of that coin. We've seen people go what we call liquidate to deficit, where you sell everything in your account. You have negative net worth of, you know, they threw everything at, at speculative strategies. And in one day, you know, things just went the wrong direction. The SVXY and XIV blowups back in 2018, I guess it would have been. And that would be an easy example of people that have been, you know, writing naked puts against those, you know, levered volatility index ETFs. Right. And it just was a free money trade for years and years and years. You get one bad shock and all of a sudden everything gets, gets erased because, you know, you've got such highly leveraged positions, no exit strategy. And that just happened dang near overnight. I mean, those blew up so quickly that it almost didn't have a chance to get out of the way in a lot of respects. So, I mean, it can go both ways. Yeah, no, I love that. So, okay, wonderful. Um, next question. What's some timeless advice that you'd like to share with the audience that you've learned along the way, whether it be in the market or in life and business, anywhere you want to go? Um, I guess I'll probably share my favorite quote about, you know, managing and making money. The easiest way to double your money is to fold it over once and put it back in your pocket. <laughs> you know, so you don't need to hit home runs every time. We don't need to be gambling and at the roulette table. Just continue to be diligent, save money, continue to invest. I would say, you know, the majority of my personal investing used to be very speculative. Now I get into a lot of just index ETFs. You know, there's, I'm not trying to beat the market there. I'll trade options around my position, certainly, but, you know, just continue to put in money every month, save, you know, a dollar saved a day with compounding. That's going to be more than a dollar tomorrow or 10 years from now. So, you know, just being diligent in that respect. Got it. And now let's talk about mistakes. What are some timeless mistakes that you've learned along the way you'd like to share with the audience, please? I would say, I guess, as far as timeless mistakes, trying to time the market too much in some mm -hmm. respects. You know, I, I think that especially as somebody who sits here all day, you know, I've got four monitors here. I've got streaming one minute charts over here. And, you know, it gets it's pretty easy to you know look at the queues, for example, see them getting dang near back to all time highs and be like, well, geez, I don't want to buy now. Well, I might have said that a month ago and, you know, it had already made a big run. And so, you know, not trying to overly time the market. We've all seen, you know, the graphs of, you know, returns over time. If you miss the 10 best days in the market or if you miss the 10 worst days in the market. And really it is time in the market, not timing the market, just consistently, you know, saving, putting money into your investments, not trying to be overly speculative and not getting too too worked up about the day-to-day -day bounces. I mean, we've seen so many shocks, the COVID sell off in one month. I mean, that happened basically between option expirations. We rolled into a bear market and then it recovered. I mean, if you'd yeah. let the, the market whipsaw you and, and emotionally impact Understood. your decisions, you might've sold out there. You know, you might not have bought when the market started to recover. Yeah, it makes pretty, even just a few weeks ago, back in late October, the market looked like it was going way lower. People were talking about uh, 1987 all over again and then bam. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. And now okay. we're up 10%. Yeah, exactly. So um, best piece of advice you'd like to give to the audience or your 30 year old self. Best piece of advice to give the audience your 30 year old self. Well, save, diversify and stay calm. 
my my nickname for my trading account is keep calm love it keep calm sell premium stick to the plan don't try to do anything too fancy you know all that GameStop hoopla that they had, you know, that guess there's a, a documentary about it now, but you know, okay, that is gambling. You might as well go to Vegas. I've bought one lottery ticket in my life and I used to trade front day options and zero data expiration options, but hundred bucks a week was the most I was willing to put in it. And that was my gambling money. When you're investing, just stay disciplined, stay calm. Don't let your emotions override things. Stay consistent. Love it. Well, Nick, thank you so much for taking the time to speak today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Adam.